Hi, welcome back to Engage and Empower Me, a patient engagement design course. I'm Dr. Kyra Bobinet, co-director, with my co-director, Dr. Larry Chu, who is the executive director of Medicine X and associate professor of anesthesia here at Stanford School of Medicine. Really glad to have you back. And um, our moderator this evening is going to be Jody Shager, who's a freelance writer, blogger, and patient advocate. She's a co-founder of BCSM, which is a breast cancer social media uh, weekly chat on Twitter. She's also a uh, Medicine X ePatient scholar and currently living with metastatic breast cancer. And with me also in our class today is Gabrielle and Isabel, and they're going to be students today in the audience. So look for them on camera. Thank you very much. Jody. Oh, oh, one other thing is we're going to go to a, a message from Medicine X from the class uh, while Jody gets set up. Thank you. If you're joining us for the first time, a quick reminder that there's a simultaneous conversation happening on Twitter right now using the hashtag MedX. Jody Shoger is the moderator of today's class and will be taking questions from social media. So please make sure to start up your Twitter client to join in the online conversation and interact with today's speaker. Christopher Snyder, otherwise known as I am Spartacus, is moderating the online tweet chat discussion this evening. Just as a reminder, Call for Abstracts and Presenters is now open for Stanford Medicine X 2014. Don't miss your chance to present at the premier patient-centered conference on emerging technology and medicine. Applications for speakers and presenters are now open until March 1st, 2014. For more information, go to medicinex.stanford.edu and apply today. Please also make sure to like us on our Facebook page at www.facebook.com forward slash Stanford MedX. Please note you are watching a live online program and there is a delay between real-time events and the live stream that you are watching. Tweets from our in-class guests will appear before you see the real-time events they are tweeting about unfold on the live video stream. Hey everyone, I'm so glad to see you all tonight. We're going to be talking about one of my patient, my favorite topics, and that's patient engagement. You're going to understand why it's been a lifelong mission and quest of mine. When I was 16, I was with my mother at a very famous hospital. Uh, she was going to undergo a complicated surgery, which resulted from a surgery the year before that had been gone bad. And um, I was used to being with her in medical situations. But for some reason, everything went wrong that day. They asked me to wait in her room, which that surprised me. But I was 16. I did as I was told. I waited, and I waited, and I waited some more. And as the hours went on, my nerves just grew to a wire. Well, eventually a nurse came and got me, and it was apparent that I was to follow her. We eventually came to a lab. Mind you, we're, we're wandering all over this hospital complex. We knock on the door and says, is this, is this the McCready family? That was me. That was me, and I was sure that she had died. And at the next moment, a man opened the door. He took a pan, and he lifted a towel. And he said, this is what we took out of your mother. I was flabbergasted. I bring up this incident for one reason only. That is the healthcare system we're going away from. We've gone away from where patients and their families are just the recipients of a one-way directional process, where someone might be at the receiving end of a process that's random and has nothing to do with the care of the patient involved. I mean, mother was in recovery, and she did fine. But it was the most startling thing that I've, you know, one of the most startling things I've ever experienced. So with stories like this, and this was just one of them, it should probably come as no surprise to you that I'm standing here tonight talking about patient engagement, since we all teach what we most need to learn. Patient engagement is on a continuum. It's something that can be scaled, and it can depend on a person's age. 
It can de depend on their gender, their generation, their personality, or, you know, w when they were born. You can have someone like my father-in-law, for example. If you ask him, how was your appointment with your, with your internist? He'll always give you a very happy, good. It was good. How is your blood work? It's good. How's your blood sugar? It's good. So he has a very low level of engagement. It has never mattered to him because he trusts his doctors. On the other hand, someone like me, in 1998, I was uh, diagnosed with my first breast cancer. And at that time, we did have the internet. And I took advantage of every particular and every resource that I could. That included books, consulting with doctors, um, talking with other patients, but I didn't have what we all know now to be the ultimate in transformation, and that was social media. When social media hit and patients could be talking to each other in real time, we started to experience a shift in patient, patient engagement like we had not experienced before. It's been really a, a remarkable remarkable process because instead of, for example, just being able to read a book about breast cancer, because of social media, I could right now put out a tweet or get into a Facebook group and say to somebody, I need to talk to a woman with triple negative breast cancer who has used the Plurex system for plural effusions. That's a high degree of engagement. And there are probably 10 people who would answer me. So you have people who were isolated in places all around the world, all of a sudden being able to interact with each other, help each other, support each other, and hopefully make the journey a lot um, more bearable. The other thing that happened with um, Social media, which Alicia talked with you about two weeks ago, happens to do with a tweet chat we developed, takes place every Monday night on Twitter. Anyone who has breast cancer follows the particular hashtag BCSM. And we can have up to 90 people in an hour on a chat sharing information, talking about the latest advances from a surgeon's con. Uh, conference or a um, new paper that's out. And that's another level of engagement that we did not have 10 years ago. If I know, for example, that there's a clinical trial that fits my kind of cancer and it's opening up in two weeks, that is significant. That is something that is not only life altering, it could indeed change my life. And in fact, I see social media as being a huge accelerator of clinical trials and developing more effective treatments for uh, metastatic breast cancer. So our BCSM today, we, um, or to show you how we've evolved, we had physicians, there were 10 physicians on our chat the other night and they were talking about physician engagement, not just patients, but what they, as a doctor, are discovering that are informing their own practices by participating in tweet chats. Dr. Don Dyson said that he, um, now Twitter is an automatic extension of my email. I check it automatically and numerous times a day. Our other co-moderator, Deanna Tai, said once she was on, I was inspired in a way by the lack of information and the wealth of misinformation and that she just had to jump in. One of our founding principles that when we talk on Twitter every week, we used evidence-based information. If we see a mistake in process, a misunderstanding about breast cancer or a breast cancer treatment, we correct it. Uh, the other thing that may surprise you is that the women and men, because there are men get breast cancer too, who are on the chat want to connect in real life. They want to know each other. They have made this kind of connection to their illness and they want to meet in real life. Um, they communicate with each other using the hashtag. And the, the community 
if you've not participated in a tweet chat, polices itself. People aren't overly self-promotional. They are there for each other, and it's a beautiful thing to, to, to witness. So if we go back to where I started when I was just a one-way recipient of a really bad process at a hospital, to where I am now, and I was de developed, uh, diagnosed with metastatic disease in April, there's been you know, a huge metamorphosis of what I know about cancer, what I know about being a patient, what I know about working with physicians for my best health. Thank you very much. Now we have our next speaker, and let me tell you a little bit about him. This is going to be terrific. Dr. Daniel Siegel received his medical degree from Harvard University and completed his postgraduate medical education at UCLA with training in pediatrics and child, adolescent, and adult psychiatry. He served as a National Institute of Mental Health Resources Fellow at UCLA studying family interactions with an emphasis on how attachment experiences influence emotion, behavior, autobiographical, memory, and merit narrative. He has written several books, the latest of which is a New York Times best-selling science book entitled Brainstorm, The Power and Purpose of the Teenage Brain. So for those of you who are watching online or following us on Twitter, We'll be right back after a brief message from Dr. Siegel. Thank you. Time to take another shout out to Twitter. If you are following this conversation online or on Twitter, Christopher Snyder, otherwise known as I am Spartacus, is moderating the Twitter discussion on the MedX hashtag. If you are joining us, we have with us today Daniel Siegel, a professor of psychiatry from UCLA, speaking with us today on the topic of compassion, connection, and engagement, how health arises from our mind, body, and relationships. E patients and caregivers out there, what questions do you have for our speaker today? What might you like to ask Dr. Siegel about how health arises from our mind, body, and relationships? Healthcare providers, technologists, and researchers out there, what are the real world problems you are facing that you think might be addressed through a better understanding of compassion, connection, and patient engagement. Tweet us your questions or responses, and we'll do our best to have him address them during this class at Stanford University School of Medicine. Engage and Empower Me for Thursday, February 13, 2014. Well, thank you, Jody. It's really fantastic to hear what uh, Jody Shoger has really uh, shared with us. The, the journey you've been on uh, is really uh, so beautifully articulated and thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, it's really uh, profound for me to be here. Um, uh, Jody was mentioning that uh, the last book I wrote is on adolescence and when I was 19 years of age, I actually spent the summer a few feet right from where we are right now uh, learning about different things. I was in college and learning about this research fellowship I was doing on the heart, the physical organ of the heart. So I was work working in the cardiology department. And soon after that, I uh, began medical school uh, at Harvard University where I was um, experiencing something very different from what we've heard is happening now, which was, and this is now the late 70s, uh, many of the experiences I had as a medical student were watching physicians who were my teachers treat the patients as if they were just bags of chemicals. And I had been a biochemistry major and I knew about enzymes, so I, I knew about enzymes, but I felt that our human lives had something much more than just chemical reactions. So uh, after a series of things that happened that I won't uh, share with you here, but I'll just tell you that they were examples of the opposite of how a physician should be with a patient, tuning into their feelings, asking about the meaning of a diagnosis, supporting them in the social networks that can allow them to survive uh, a devastating diagnosis and a devastating treatment. Um, bless you. Uh, we uh, 
found at that time that that was just the way it was as medical students. So I ended up dropping out and I went on a journey just of discovery to figure out uh, something else to do because I didn't want to become that kind of professional. Uh, and ultimately, this was now 1980, ultimately um, I was really uh, very focused on the idea that there had to be a way to bring to medicine some kind of deep scientific understanding of what it meant to be human. So I came back to school, I finished and got my degree, uh, came back to California and started working in pediatrics and then switched to psychiatry and ultimately became very interested in, in something that, was a, that saved my life when I had returned to school, which was the concept of something I'll share with you, mind sight, the ability to actually see the mind. So that when Jody shares with us the idea that you reach out to other people, you're saying, inside of me, I'm struggling, I've got this diagnosis, I'm having this treatment go on, I'm concerned. Does anyone else having this similar kind of experience? You're really reaching beyond just enzymes and you're getting more to the level of what's emotionally meaningful in someone's life. And so for me, when I went back to school, this word mindsight was, how do you actually see beyond just the physical nature of what it means to be alive? How do you see the subjective core of what the mind is really all about. How do you see the mind, mind sight? So I made up this word in my head. So when I saw professors who didn't have it, I would say to myself, ah, that one doesn't have it. Use them like a bad example. You know, sometimes it's good to see a bad play because you can really appreciate a good one. Uh, and so the teachers didn't change, but I had changed. And I carried that with me. And what was fascinating when I went to psychiatry not only clinical work, but in research, I got a, a National Institute of Mental Health grant to actually study how the capacity to see the mind in yourself or in your child is the best predictor of the child's developmental course. So there are lots of words used for that um, from a narrative point of view up here at Berkeley. Uh, Mary Main talks about what's called a coherent narrative, how you make sense of your life. Uh, in London, Peter Fonagy used the term reflective function and changed that later to mentalization. Other people had come up with words like being mind-minded or psychologically minded. All these roughly get at a similar notion that we have a physical nature to our lives, like when you see my arms move, but there's also a mental side to life. And it turns out that in the brain, you've got very different circuits. So Gabriella and Isabella, they're learning about life, you know, when their wonderful dad tunes into them. Does your dad want to know how you feel when, like, you fall down and see how you're doing? Yeah. yeah. So Dan is turning, tuning into his daughters and wanting to know how they feel. In families where that doesn't happen, what do you think it would be like if a parent didn't ask how a kid was feeling if they fell down? How would that feel? It would feel really bad. What, what do you think? And they'd be crying, the parents wouldn't pay attention. Exactly. And so if you developed in a family, and we can study this, about 20% of the population has a family like that, where there really isn't tuning into the inner subjective nature of life. Let's just call that the mind. So I'm not using mind as compared to heart, or mind as compared to feelings, or mind as cognition versus emotion or something like that. I'm using mind in the broadest sense of internal subjective experience. It's not the same as neural firing. Even though a lot of neuroscientists will reduce mind to saying the mind is what the brain does, which actually doesn't make any sense. Because we're talking about, in this case, a subjective inner core, not just ions flowing in and out of membranes. So the mind, as at least having subjective experience, becomes really important when you look at families. And if you look at studies even on the physician-patient relationship that have been done, it's actually quite remarkable. I'll give you an example. You tell me what you think happened. This is a study that was done where a patient had just a common cold, and they went into a physician, and there were two conditions that happened. One condition, the physician made a statement, oh, you're a student, and you've got a cold, and you have exams coming up. This must be really hard for you. Here, rest and take lots of fluids, something like that. That's condition number one. Condition number two, come in, same cold, you know, control groups and everything. And the person comes in and says, oh, you have a common cold. Just rest and take lots of fluids. The difference 
could have been just 20, 30 seconds. One group had improved immune function with a 10 minute visit and got over their cold a day sooner than the other group. Which group was which, do you think? The first group where all the physician did was tune into the subjective experience of their patient and the patient got better. Nothing else was different. So we now know, and this is something I wish I would have had back when I was a student and when I was in my adolescence in medical school, it would have been nice to say, hey, what you're doing is, doesn't only really hurt people's feelings, it actually hurts their bodies. That empathy is not a luxury. Empathy is essential for well-being. This is true in our work in attachment research where we actually study the way patterns of a parent talking to kids can result in optimal functioning with resilience or not. So that systematically we can study that and then we can infer from different other studies what's probably happening in the brain of the child. And you say, well, how does that happen? So the first time I, would, I wrote about this in a book called The Developing Mind, people would say, oh, you're really out of your mind, Dan. And even though they didn't have a definition of mind, they still said I was out of it. And I said, well, why are you saying I'm out of my mind? And they would say, because you're talking about relationships in the brain. But the fact is now we know that the communication patterns we have stream energy and information flow between people. And that flow can be studied specifically in how it activates particular circuits in the brain. And the brain, this organ up in our heads, is actually the social organ of the body. It's also the regulatory organ of the body. And here's what I'll have you consider in terms of this idea of patient engagement. When you come with a common cold to your physician and there's a communication as brief as 30 seconds that's empathic, the profound difference is that your internal subjective world, when it's seen, you can become soothed and you feel safe and you feel secure. These four S's, which are what we study in attachment, but it happens in a patient-physician relationship. You're seen, you feel soothed because you're seen. There's a sense that you will be protected and so you're safe and you feel secure, and all of that develops a whole set of circuitry in the brain, and I've, I've edited 36 textbooks on this field I work in called interpersonal neurobiology, and in that series with Norton, one of the textbooks is by Steve Porges, so we have a 400-page textbook about this two-sentence thing I'm about to tell you, so there's a lot up behind everything I'm saying, uh, but this is just so everyone can understand. There's a whole circuit in your brain which turns on when you feel safe, and literally allows you to do what Steve Porges says is turn on a social engagement system. So when someone's making an empathic comment, you're literally changing your whole physiology from a reactive state, which is the fight, flight, freeze, and faint response, to the open receptivity that comes with social engagement. So this process is not just a luxury. And I know when I was in medical school, I used to feel so pained inside of me because when I was in college, I had worked not only in a biochemistry lab trying to find the enzyme that lets salmon go from fresh water to salt water and survive. At night, I worked on the suicide prevention service. And I was taught that the way you are as a listener on the phone, your responses to someone in a suicidal crisis could make the difference between whether that person lived or died. So I knew from that literally on that kind of online experience, that communication was everything. So I want to ask you this. Why would communication between two people uh, increase the immune system of a patient with a common cold so they get over a day sooner? Why is the communication between a child and a parent the biggest predictor of how that child turns out? And you can actually study even the way the parent's own system works. What's going on there? Shouldn't it be that an enzyme is an enzyme, and if you live in your body, it doesn't really matter what happens to your relation? You know, it should just be like the things you stick in your mouth or the surgeries you have or something? Why would a patient-physician relationship make a difference? So this question is huge. And what I'll have you consider is the reason it makes a difference 
is because of another process I want to talk about, and then we'll open it up for discussion. This is a process that, after reading the literature, and basically what, what I did with all this energy I had about this stuff, is um, in, when I was asked to be the training director in child psychiatry, it was right at the beginning of the decade of the brain. And I had been taught by a number of people outside of my field in medicine. I was taught by psychologists and anthropologists and brain researchers and all sorts of folks. So I, when I became a faculty member, I brought them all in and I said, let's address this question of how is the mind and the brain, how do those two entities actually relate to each other? Are they the same thing? Is one a verb, the other is a noun? What, what, what's going on here? And in the process of running that group, I discovered that no one had a definition of the word mind, actually, which was fascinating. But I also discovered that every field, let's say anthropology or mathematics, physics, biology, psychology, all these fields had something very important and unique to offer. And taken together, you can get a picture of the whole in a very different way. So it's like the old Indian fable, the blind man and the elephant. Every blind person studies an aspect of the elephant, and that's fantastic, but there is a whole elephant. If we believe there's a whole elephant of being human, then we need to be able to embrace the incredibly important studies of anthropology and the study of culture, sociology and the study of groups, psychology and the study of the mind, biology and the study of life systems, chemistry, the study of molecules, physics, the study of the, how the universe is put together, and mathematics. There ought to be one field that combines them all. So back in 1992, the beginning of such a field was created, and I had to name it something, so it's called interpersonal neurobiology. And what we do is we combine all the fields of science into one framework. And then we ask a question, for example, how can you bring science to life? How can you understand how Gabriella and Isabella are growing up within the setting of the love of their dad so that they actually thrive because of it? Why is that? Is there a fundamental principle that will allow us to understand culture and the relationships among people in cultures and the significant information that's shared across a culture and properties of mathematics and physics? If there's one reality, can we actually illuminate the nature of it? So this became kind of the project, uh, and it led to a book written called The Developing Mind, which makes the following proposal which tries to tie everything together from what we heard from Jody and this idea of engagement with patients. It's a simple term, and that book was published at the end of the last uh, millennium. But the second edition was just published, and I had 15 interns work with me. Uh, and I said to these interns, I said, we're going to revise the first edition, and your job, if you're the intern, is going to be to show that the first edition is wrong. Prove that it's wrong so that we can actually come up with ideas that are more accurate. And they go, what are you talking about, prove it's wrong? I said, yeah, that's, that'll be fun. Just prove it's all wrong, let's write a new book. Um, and so they went after it like crazy to find out where all the science in the last 12 years could prove it's wrong. And they couldn't find anything but about one or two things that they could change, but there was supportive evidence for what I'm about to tell you. So that book, The Developing Mind, um, has Basically, a proposal from the 1990s that I'm going to tell you right now, and then 12 years of a huge amount of empirically established research from other individuals, other laboratories, that supports the following statement. And it's painfully simple, and I would tell these interns what I'm going to tell you now. This has got to be wrong. Someone please show it's wrong, because it's too simple. And they couldn't find a single thing to disprove it, and a bunch of stuff to support it. That doesn't prove it, but I'm, I, I need your help to tell me why this isn't true, because it's too simple. Here it is. You ready? Integration is health, period. Integration, and we're going to define that term, is the linkage of differentiated parts. So in a system, you can have elements of the system become unique and specialized. So in a family, you've got a dad who's different from one daughter who's different from the other daughter, and those differences are honored. In fact, they're enjoyed. Does 
that's the differentiation. The linkage in the family would be loving, compassionate communication happens where the inner world of each person is seen so a person can feel soothed and safe and secure. And ultimately, that kind of relationship, even of the patient with the common cold, coming in to that system of opening up and saying, I'm sick, help me. When there's a differentiation going on and an honoring with the linkage, a compassionate, empathic statement that's made, it becomes an integrated system. And the system of the mind is not limited to the head, for sure. It's throughout the body, and it's not even limited to your skin. The mind is as much a relational process as it is an embodied one. And so when you start realizing it this way, you realize the, the experience of being a healer, let's say for medical students who might be listening, or any caregiver of any sort, is that we engage with others with a fundamental connecting essence, which is energy and information flow. And this whole course is about how do you actually do that? So integration is the linkage of differentiated parts. And what is absolutely startling, and you have to make sure you understand the, the use of the term, is when you look at the mathematics, they don't use the word integration like this, but they do use the concept of a system which is open to influences from outside of itself, a system which has these three properties. It's open to influences from outside of itself. It's nonlinear, meaning small inputs leads to large and unpredictable results. And it's capable of being chaotic. And just think about your life. Would you say that stuff happens to you that's outside of what you would call you? Anyone say yes to that? OK, so you are open, open system. How about um, are you nonlinear where something can happen in the morning that you didn't predict and it leads to large and unpredictable results? Anyone have that experience? All right, so you are nonlinear too. And do you ever have chaos going on inside of you or among you, in, right? OK, so we are chaos-capable, nonlinear, open systems. Now, that, by mathematics, lands us in a definition of a complex system. And here's what math offers to us. The study of mathematics shows that complex systems have what are called emergent properties. That's just built into the math of a complex system. This isn't some Lulu, you know, California term. You know, we're in California. Let's say emergent properties. No, it's a mathematical <laughs> property. You know, unless we made up numbers or something like that. It's a mathematical property. Now, what is the emergent property we're talking about? One of those properties is called self-organization. And what's absolutely fascinating about the com complex theory, complexity theory that looks at self-organization is that the optimal movement of a complex system across time that's the most flexible and adaptive, coherent, meaning it holds together fluidly over time, energized and stable, and that spells an acronym, FACES, flexible, adaptive, coherent, energized, and stable. That describes a system that is moving that way because it is linking the differentiated parts of the system. That's straight out of math. If we take the word linkage of differentiated parts, just put a name to it that mathematics people don't like, because for them, integration is addition. So when they hear it, they go, oh, don't call it an integration. But in common everyday use, in medical use, integration is fine. In biological use, it's fine. Integration is where you have to hold on to the differences and link them. You know the phrase, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts? That's integration. For a mathematician, the word integration just means addition. You don't care whether it's 3 and 8 gets you to 11, or 7 and 4 gets you to 11. It doesn't matter. But in integration, it does matter. You maintain the differences between people. You maintain left and right hemisphere differences, whatever it is. So the bottom line of this is that integration creates this self-organizational movement toward well-being, is what this flow is. It's basically harmony. The outcome of integration, if you can feel a choir singing in harmony, it's where they are differentiating their voices in harmonic intervals, and they are linking them. They're differentiating in sopranos and you know, the baritones and the bass. Everyone's differentiating and they're linking. That's the vitality you feel of harmony. The other amazing thing, and this is the last bit I'll say and then I'll kind of wrap this up. When you don't have integration, what happens is you get chaos or rigidity. And when I read that, 
Back in the early 90s, I turned to the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and I went through every single symptom of every single syndrome, which could be reinterpreted as either chaos, rigidity, or both. So the proposal was, hey, maybe psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia or autism or manic depressive illness are actually results of impaired integration. No one had looked in the brain of those disorders, of people with those disorders, so who knew? So it was a hypothesis, but what the interns found is that Marcus Rakel at the University of Washington in St. Louis found in patients with schizophrenia, impaired integration, patients with autism, impaired integration, patients with bipolar disorder, impaired integration, and at Harvard University, Marty Teicher showed if, sadly, you're not treated like Isabella and Gabriella are with love and kindness, but in fact have severe abuse or severe neglect, the integrative fibers of the brain don't grow well. And in fact, integration is impaired with experientially produced problems, psychiatric problems. The other ones are non-experientially produced. Patients with schizophrenia or manic depressive illness or autism. So right now, at least in, in the conditions that have been studied, every single one of them has impaired neural integration. And the reason integration of the brain is important is because if you ever have ever heard of the term regulation, like how do I regulate attention or regulate emotion or affect or regulate thought or regulate behavior, you know, so I'm not impulsive, or regulate my relationships, those fall under the big category of self-regulation or executive functions. It turns out, the interns could not find a single exception to this, every single form of regulation requires integration, linking differentiated parts. You say, why is that? Because it allows the coordination and balance of a system. So the thing I'll have you consider is that we're not just talking about the brain, we're talking about the mind. And the mind, what I'm going to propose to you, besides consciousness and subjective experience, is a self-organizing process that is both embodied and relational. And the reason Jody and I have had such problems with the earlier kind of medicine that was there, and the reason social media can be so helpful, is because you're allowing yourself to be a differentiated person and linking. What my deepest hope is, is in medicine, that people being trained in medicine don't have what I have which was being taught how to be a professional who paid no attention to the differentiated inner self. And you know something? Studies show even if we as medical students could be taught that, listen, when you sit with someone, you don't, even if you're trying to be empathic, you don't go, oh, what if that were me? And you don't, if there's no differentiation and you just tune in and you try to link without differentiation, you know what studies of the brain show? Your brain actually goes haywire it stops functioning well and it shuts down. Whereas if you give a person the same setup and say, don't think, what if that were me? Because then there's no differentiation. Think, I wonder what that person in that situation may be feeling inside of themselves. And it sounds subtle, but the brain response is completely different. Then the person remains differentiated, but links and activates the circuitry of compassion which is the circuitry literally of, I call them mindset maps. You're not only making a mindset map of yourself, so there's me, I make a mindset map of you, but then I also make this mindset map of we, and I engage my circuitry getting ready to help you because I don't feel overwhelmed. That's the power of integration to allow compassion to turn into action and not what we call burnout, which really isn't burnout, it's just you're flooded, you, you aren't, differentiating enough. So this is where the concept of integration allows you to go into the circuitry in the brain. It allows you to go into a relationship at home. It allows you to go into a relationship with physicians and patients. It allows you to even look at large societies. And it gives us something very clear to do in terms of assessment, in terms of intervention, and in terms of evaluating how our interventions work to create more well-being in the world. And ultimately, integration made visible is kindness and compassion. That's what we can create in this world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so Thank much. You. That was fascinating. Thank you. Oh, I just loved it. Um,
we're going to take a few moments here and then we're going to have some questions. Sure. Because I'm full of questions and I'm sure that all of you are too. So let's see what we've got. That was great. Oh, thank you, Jody. Yours is great too. Oh, come on. Hi, I was wondering, um, using your model of integration, how the phenomenon of compassion fatigue may arise and what can be done to fix it? Excellent question. So, yeah, the phrase compassion fatigue is a very important phrase, but some people are suggesting we should rename it. We should rename it empathy fatigue for the following reasons. That studies are suggesting that and there's nine different kinds of empathy, so we have to be really careful whenever we see a word that we understand what we mean by the word and at least we have a shared understanding of it. So if people mean by compassion fatigue, I'm caring too much and getting burnt out, uh, studies suggest you're, you may be over-identifying with the, the people you're trying to help, like I, like I mentioned. Your brain is having a reaction, I have no resources, if that is me, there's nothing I can do. Well, because that's not you. Of course, there's nothing you can do, right? If, if you constantly identify with other people and don't differentiate, there's literally nothing you can do. So you burn out. So the compassion people that I've been talking to say, that's not compassion. That's over-identification. Mm -hmm. And if you want, put it in the empathy you know, category of the nine different kinds of empathy. Mm -hmm. For them, compassion is feeling with another person, not feeling as if you were that person. Notice the real, it's subtle but huge. You, you maintain your differentiated nature, and when you do, you feel resourceful, and you actually not only feel resourceful, you are replenished by reaching out to help. Does that make sense? Thank you. Hi, my question is linked with her yes. question. So vicarious traumatization is not existing anymore? So vicarious traumatization would be a different sort of thing. You, you know, that's a whole different thing than compassion fatigue, which is a term used for a care provider who's there for the purpose of serving the other person. So vicarious trauma happens all the time, and that would be different. There may be a number of different ways that happens. So, um, you know, in a family, you can have one individual being the target of the focused abuse and another witnessing it, and that is completely traumatic because it's overwhelming, there's a helplessness, it floods the individual who's witnessing with cortisol, and that would be called mm -hmm. vicarious traumatization. So that's different from compassion fatigue. Another is where you know, we have this system of neurons called mirror neurons, where we automatically, like, I think they should be called sponge neurons, mm -hmm. you know, we soak in like a sponge, we're not so much mirroring back, as the Italians named it that way, and that's the way it's stuck, but they're really more like sponges, so you sponge in the internal sensations of another person and you can absolutely be flooded if you don't have a certain practice to kind of wring your sponge out, if you will. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, a study of teaching mindfulness to primary care physicians mm -hmm. has shown that the burnout that those physicians tend to have is massively reduced and their capacity to maintain and increase their empathy is hugely increased um, with mindfulness practices. So, there's, I feel that mindfulness is a way of tuning into your internal self and creating an integrated state that allows you to engage in others without the vicarious traumatization. So it's a little, it, it can overlap a little bit, you're absolutely right, but it usually has a wider thing about just absorbing, literally soaking in the trauma of others, even when you're not trying to help them. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, as you know, we've got a two-way audience. We have this audience, and we also have our Twitter listeners. So let's send some shouts to Cascadia, Sherry Reynolds, uh, Kristen Coppins, Kat Ellington, Stales, Meredith Gould, um, and a number of people are listening and watching. We have a question from C. Blotner, Catherine. And her question is, what are differences between the mindset of chronic patients versus newcomers to a disease? Mm. Mm, that's a good you question. want to respond to that? Wow. Well, I was wanting to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's both do it. Yeah, we'll, we'll differentiate yeah. and link. <laughs> my, my, my question is how the hearing a terminal incurable diagnosis upsets your integration. Mm. So this would be similar to what happens to the person when they hear 
that they have a chronic disease. Maybe not necessarily terminal, but chronic in that every day of their life is going to be here on altered, whether they're 25, 35, yes. 45, 55. Well, you want to say more about that? Because I'll say a couple of things, but well, you, you have jump the in. science. I'm just <laughs> well, yeah. I don't. I don't know what the science yeah. of it is. I can just say, for, as a clinician mm -hmm. or as a person, um, you know, the 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 mind is fascinating. It builds on um, what happens in the brain, and mm -hmm. it builds on relationships. So the mind okay. is both embodied and relational. If we go to the brain side of that, the the question, right? Um, the brain is called an anticipation machine. And it creates these things called mental models mm. that are kind of the groundwork, the foundation for our narratives. Okay. You know, I, I, I was trained right. as a narrative scientist and we're kind of always studying, you know, how these mental models influence narrative structure. Mm -hmm. So if you're walking through life and you say, well, this is who I am. I've got this body. I'm 25 years old and, you know, I've got my life ahead of me and all this stuff happening. And then suddenly I start getting infections or something happens. I go to the doctor and they mm -hmm. say, listen, I need to tell you something. Mm -hmm. This is what we found. X is what you have. Mm -hmm. So just that moment, I, this is a part of the first part of the right. question, just that moment is an assault on the mental model that I'm fine and I can rely on my body. Right. Right. So inside, in terms of the brain, mm -hmm. there's a, a, a conflict between the differentiated mental model of I have a body, everything's fine, I'm 25, everything's going to be fine, mm -hmm and now the new information that's come in. Right. So in terms of the question about how that affects integration, part of the struggle of dealing with the diagnosis, assuming it's accurate, mm -hmm. um, Correct. you know, because you want to make sure that's yeah, true. For sure. Don't ever trust anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, no, seriously, you always want to check those things. Mm -hmm. um, from personal experience, Absolutely. I can tell you that. Uh, so you, you, know, you have this conflict between new information and a mental model. Mm -hmm. And you know, my teacher of narrative, Jerry Bruner, used mm -hmm. to always say that narratives emerge from a violation of expectations. Now, this relates to Pennebaker's work that you may be familiar with, journal writing, where the act of journal writing profoundly improves immune function in the face of traumatic events. So you can say, why is that? Well, if you put Bruner and Pennebaker together mm -hmm. and look at the brain as this you know, anticipation machine mm -hmm. that's building these mental models that filter ongoing experience through this complex system, then you can understand in terms of the first part of that question mm -hmm. that when you're given a diagnosis, it's shattering of the easy non-violation thing. And so writing in a journal will be really, really important. That's number one. Number two, the question was, mm -hmm. well, what happens when you have that a long time? A as you probably know, and maybe you can share with us, mm -hmm. yeah. a lot of patients who have come to wrestle with a diagnosis, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, even one that's, that's terminal, right. And after all, life is a terminal thing, right. you know, so it's really just a matter of when, mm -hmm. not if. Uh, I don't want to shock anybody, but if you, if you told them that, Dan. <laughs> you know, but, but this is something, of course, in adolescence you, 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 you wrestle with, and it's, it's probably the most important issue of humanity. Uh, and certainly Ernst Becker, you know, wrote about this uh, in the denial of death, you know, that we deny it. But anyway, so, so you hear that when you go through the grieving process that is I'm grieving the loss of what I used to believe and now coming to embrace with all the pathways that includes of shock and denial and anger and now I'm coming to embrace it you will hear people say with some of those devastating illnesses these were the best three months of my life mm -hmm. that woke me up mm -hmm. I was asleep before and I wouldn't give it up for anything mm -hmm. you hear that so often uh, and certainly when you read the book um, Far From the Tree by Andrew mm -hmm. Solomon, mm -hmm. you'll see a beautiful explication of just this issue cool. that parents deal with. So, so I think that's where your brain, literally from a brain point of view, has wrestled with giving up the mental model that used to exist, created a new one, and the new one allows a freshness and a vitality that often, even though it may be a short amount of time, people feel they would never let go of. And these things aren't set in stone, meaning your mind adapts Exactly. It takes in new information and forms new narratives. I have this disease and I am exactly. right. Exactly. That's and that, I love the way you said that because it's not, I am this disease. Right. I have, have this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, one more from Twitter. And this is from Afternoon Napper. And she wants to know, <laughs> where does PAC mentality fit into the patient and or provider experience? Is there a difference between in real life and online? 
Pack mentality. Pack mentality. Um, what Where do, what do you think she means by that? Pack mentality. Fit into the... Uh, can you write to us? Yeah. Or are you taking a nap? If she's not no. taking a nap... What, an afternoon nap I, it's or It's a fascinating question, question, but what, what is pack mentality? Yeah. I don't know if she can fire uh, you a question. I'll give you clarification. Okay, okay, thank you. Because it would be a great question to answer if we knew what... Yeah, what, exactly. And um, is there another question in here? Yes. Really resonate with me, and I'm sort of inspired to act. However, it's still a little bit abstract, and you already gave some examples of this. But I was wondering if you had more examples of exact words or phrases or tones that I or doctors can use to be more empathetic. Absolutely. Thank you for thank you for the the question. Um, I wrote a book called Mindsight, which is all about how, um, as a clinician, you can do all these things. So that book exists, and it's out there, and you can see. Mm -hmm. Um, the book, The Developed Mind, would be kind of the more uh, textbook science behind it, but the mindset would be the clinical cases that you could, you could see there. So it can be something really simple, where if you think about, like, let's say between me and you right now, you have a mind with an internal subjective experience, and I have a mind with an internal subjective experience. We could have an interaction, if you were my physician and I'm your patient, where you just treat me like I'm a walking body, mm -hmm. right? So you say, well, this is going on your heart, and sorry, you got this problem in your heart or whatever. Here's your medicine, goodbye. Mm -hmm. And like no one would say you were mean. You could even be kind of upbeat about it and just whatever. But you wouldn't tune into my internal state. So the first thing you can think about as a physician, let's say I'm the patient, would be to use the, uh, the following acronym, SIFT. S-I-F-T. You want to sift my mind. You want to know what are my sensations. That is, what am I feeling in my body? Mm -hmm. Eyes, what images do I have? What are my worries about what's going on in my heart? Let's say you're a cardiology person. Uh, F, what are my feelings? What are my emotions? And T, what are my thoughts? So at a minimum, if a, if a clinical trainee and then you know, a clinician were sifting the mind of their patients, their clients, this would be a great start. Part of what it amplifies that a bit more and lets you know what's going on inside of you uh, and what's going on inside of me too is the nonverbal world. And this comes really interesting when it comes to left-right hemisphere differences because there's a dominance in the right side of the brain for picking up the following nonverbal signals. And I'll give you an example of what it would be like if I were um, an educator up here speaking to you without any of them. I'm going to try now. You guys ready? Thank you for inviting me to come today to talk about the mind. It's really interesting. And um, I hope you really enjoy this talk. Any questions? Like that, right? <laughs> but the nonverbal world would be eye contact. Sorry, wasn't that freaky? <laughs> She's still not yeah, over it. Yeah, right. What happened to him? You got to see her face like, whoa, I whoa. don't want to. Here whoa. I am. I'm back. So, uh, <laughs> so, so let's, let's, let's do this together. Do it with your, your body. Let's embody this, right? Mm -hmm. Eye contact. Say okay. eye contact. Eye contact. Facial expressions. Facial expressions. Here, look up here. Facial expressions. Tone of voice. Tone of voice. Posture. Sure. Gestures. Timing. And intensity of response. Intensity of response. And some people like to also put touch, but you know, from a professional point of view, that may not be appropriate, so mm -hmm. we'll just leave that out for here. But let's do it again, and you say it. You ready? Just let everyone do it. These are, these are the important mm -hmm. nonverbal signals that we're not trained in, but they actually give us a direct window into the internal mental life of another person. Eye, Eye contact, contact, facial, facial expression, expressions, tone, tone of, of voice, voice posture, posture, gestures, gestures timing, and, Oops, and intensity. Timing and so, intensity. So that's what you're really picking up, and it lets you get a feeling for things. So people may not be so easily able to put words to their sensations, images, feelings, or thoughts, but you may pick up something, just like if the physician with the common cold says, well, you're a student, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God, and this is December. Aren't you taking finals? Mm. Yeah, I'm taking final exam. This must be so hard because you've studied all semester long. Now you've got this cold. Wow. Okay. So that would be an example of saying it. And just making a note of it, the last thing I'll just say is like, if I have a patient coming from a weekend who went to San Francisco and I'm down to LA, before he says anything, I said, how was San Francisco? So he knows he's inside of me. The, the feeling you have when this happens is called feeling felt. Mm. It's the most important feeling in life. Mm -hmm. 
is that we feel felt by another person. It's the way your separate self and my separate self become joined as a we. Mm -hmm. That's what life is all about, and that's unfortunately what people are missing. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. And we have another one so right here. That, that was great. Um, you kind of talked about the way that a physician can go about sort of softening blows and listening and things yeah. like that. And you talked about um, journaling and things that the uh, you know someone who's experiencing an illness or something can do. I'm wondering if uh, you've encountered situations where rather than do either of those, um, like the language or the cultural situation sort of sets completely different expectations. Mm. So we have ideas that, you know, you said people don't feel safe in their body when they're diagnosed with something. Mm -hmm. And that's because we think that the entirety of the illness is contained, the locus is in the body. Mm -hmm. Whereas we may encounter a culture where that's not true. Mm -hmm. That illness may be somewhere else and you're just experiencing it in your body mm -hmm. in a strange way. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if yeah. you can talk about how oh, mindfulness yeah. and thing Things are different in those different cultures. Absolutely. You know, we have a, a center at UCLA called the Center for Culture, Brain, and Development, where mm -hmm. we study just that issue. How cultural, uh, you know, way, patterns of communicating and belief and understanding and narratives, all that actually shape the structure of the brain. Um, mm -hmm. And, of course, the brain also influences culture. So these are, you know, mutually influence each other. So as a physician, you really want to know what is the belief of this person. This is... The beautiful thing about, let's say, just use the word mindsight. The beautiful thing about mindsight as a physician is your job is to know the internal meaning of, of what's going on, just as you're saying. And there's such a wide array of cultural practices that we can understand. Some people may have beliefs this way or that way. And it's the central thing about an empathic connection that we understand the cultural meaning completely. Thank you. Absolutely. We have time for one more question. Hit this is really special. Thanks for the opportunity to listen. So I'm very intrigued by this 4S notion. Uh, and I was trained as a clinical psychologist. And now I train other clinical psychologists. And people that come to see us at our training clinic, there's the assumption, it's a big assumption, that we're able to actually offer these people the opportunity to feel seen, soothed, safe, secured, and so forth. And sometimes that actually happens. And people come in and they get help. But then I look at their experiences and I can't help but wonder about is this the best way for them to feel seen, soothed, secure and safe and so forth because I feel like if they were able to give that 4S experience or receive that 4S experience from other people within their life, they would probably benefit a lot more. So I'm curious about asking you, in addition to this expert mediated model that's been described, what are you feeling optimistic about in terms of intervention programs or cultural impact or sociological impact type of mm. initiatives that could bring about the 4S experience for different people, not yeah. in a clinical or expert-mediated context? Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? Well, you know, um, I just released this book called Brainstorm, which offers to adolescents who read it and to adults who read it too a chance to change the cultural conversation about adolescence. And it talks about the 4Ss in there and talks really about how we as a culture can start a different pattern of communicating with each other, not just in a clinical setting, just like you're saying, and even not just in schools, which could obviously do it, or not just at homes. So I think there's a way, actually, of changing the whole cultural conversation around compassion, mm -hmm. around understanding that this is not a luxury. If we, if we really understand integration is health, and that integration is the fundamental mechanism that creates compassion, it's a win-win situation. We may be able to support the idea of having empathic joy mm -hmm. instead of competitive aggression, where you know, when people are doing well, we all are doing well. And we can harness, in the adolescent book, I talk about harnessing the power of competition to say, OK, let's set up a competition with the world's problems, you know, violence, climate change issues, famine, all the things that exist. And let adolescents and others, too, work really hard to beat the enemy and that when the enemy is beaten, everybody wins. That's the kind of intentional cultural evolution we can do. And I think with integration as the root of all that, there's a huge amount of possibility. And I'm extremely optimistic about how together, with all these things that Jody talked about and all the things that you're doing here in this seminar, it's possible to actually make a cultural shift. I think that's awesome. And we have 30 seconds. Mm. And this is a great wrap up because she's talking, this is back to Afternoon Napper. She's asking, how does a group 
influence or impact. Compassion and empathy. Oh, beautiful. Well, yeah. this is exactly what we're talking exactly. about. And if that's the pack, pack mentality that we can make it really cool to be compassionate, mm -hmm. really cool to develop integration, that's going to be great. That's going to be really fantastic. I think we can do it. I really do. And I'll say one last thing about that. When we develop an identity, not just as a me, and even not just as a we, but I end the book with this, the brainstorm book with this, an identity as a we, mm -hmm. M-W-E, allows an integrated identity where, yes, I have a body that I live in, that's my me. I have an interconnected self, that's a we. And to really be having a differentiated and linked Beautiful. self, an integrated self, I can develop a sense of a we. Bless you. And that's something we can do. Oh, that's awesome. Yes. That's awesome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. This was a great class. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Oh, I'm we. I'm we. You know, so many of your ideas. Thanks so much for joining us tonight for this class on compassion, connection, and engagement. How health arises from our mind, body, and relationships with Daniel Siegel and guest moderator Jody Shoger. Please also remember to join us again next week, Thursday, February 20th, with guest speakers Ronnie Zeiger and Gilles Friedman, who will speak on the topic of leveraging social relationships in patient engagement. Stanford Medicine X ePatient scholar Sarah Kucharski will moderate the discussion. Just as a reminder, Call for Abstracts and Presenters is now open for Stanford Medicine X 2014. Don't miss your chance to present at the premier patient-centered conference on emerging technology and medicine. Applications for speakers and presenters is now open until March 1st, 2014. For more information, go to medicinex.stanford.edu and apply today. On behalf of Stanford Medicine X, the Stanford AIM Lab, class faculty Dr. Larry Chu and Dr. Kyra Bobinette, thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next week.